Good morning. It's uh, March 29th, 2011. We're in Fairhope, Alabama. My name is Louis Blaze, and I'm conducting an interview for the Veterans History Project. I'll be interviewing this morning Mr. Dick Moon, who served in both World War II and the uh, Korean War. Morning, Dick. Good morning. How are you this yeah, morning, sir? Very good, thank you. Just a little background. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Chicago in uh, 1927. And a uh, little bit about your family? Uh, tw excuse me, 28. 28? I, I got uh, Army birthday and everything. I get That's right, I, I heard about that. I won't get into that in just okay. a minute. Uh, your parents, what was the uh, parents' occupations? My dad was a structural steel worker, and uh, my mother was a housewife. Okay, uh, your uh, lineage, I understand, is Native American on Native. on your dad's side. Right, I'm a uh, fifty percent Mohican, and the Mohicans did a lot of high work on. Uh, they were, they seemed to go for structural steel. They were not afraid of, I guess, walking the beams, you know, and that, or the height. So my dad fit right in there, and. He, he got uh, quite a bit of work up there. You have uh, brothers and sisters? I had one brother and two sisters. Were, uh, was your brother in the military also? Uh, he's the reason I went into World War II. He, oh, really? Yeah, he was uh, captured by the Germans in uh, Italy. And he was a prisoner of war there. And, uh, I was quite young, and I went down and lied my age to get in, and uh, I was going over to rescue him, and uh, I went in at 15. How did you manage, how many did you manage that, Jed? I, I just went down to the uh, draft board and told them I was 18 on that day, and uh, they just signed me up. And he said, when do you want to go? And I said, the next group. And whoosh, I was gone. Fifteen years of age. Fifteen years of age. And uh, where, did, where did you go? They shipped me to uh, Arkansas, outside of Little Rock, uh, uh, Camp Robinson there, and give me basic training, infantry training and that. and. Uh, from there, I, I got shipped overseas. How, how was it being a 15-year-old amongst, I, I imagine a lot of guys who are a lot older than you, did you seem to fit in okay with them? Uh, it was hard for me because I think I tried to convince them that I was 18, you know, and they, I had to act like a man, you know. Uh, like smoking, I never smoked, you know. Well, you got to smoke when you're at that time because they gave you a, cigarettes and your rations and that and so I smoked a little bit and they took me into town and taught me how to drink beer <laughs> so uh, I, I got awful sick on it but I had to show them that I could handle it because I was a man you know. Now uh, you chose the army because you felt that was your best chance of rescuing your brother? Well, I, I thought it would be, you know, I, I didn't want, uh, I knew the Navy wouldn't be over there or the, the Marines. They were all over in the Pacific at the time and the Marines, so I figured with the Army I'd have a better chance. And uh, being that I didn't have any occupation or that, Naturally, I mean, being they figured I just got out of school and that they put me in the infantry, you know, because I wasn't uh, uh, had a big, you know, education in any job or that, you know, where yeah. it'd be. Uh, what grade were you in? When I left? Yes. I was in 10th grade. In the 10th grade? Wow. Right. Okay, uh, after you finished boot camp, then where'd you go? Uh, or basic? Basic. Uh, I went, uh, they gave me a delay en route to go home and uh, then they shipped me to, uh, out to uh, Fort Dix 
in New Jersey, and they put me on one of their cruise ships, you know, like in the, uh, the Army had, which I think they called them troop transports. Troop transports, yeah. Uh, and it was quite crowded. Everybody, I think, signed up for the cruise. And we got a, a convoy and went over to Europe. Is that the first time you'd ever been out on the ocean? Well, first time I'd ever been really out of Wisconsin or anything. I mean, I was, I was a green boy. I mean, yeah. Tenth grader. <laughs> you don't travel much, you know, at that time, you know. And so I just. Uh, and where did the, where did y'all go? I went from uh, there right over to La Havre, France. We we're in Normandy there and landed in uh, where the D-Day was. And we went in on a makeshaft uh, port and went to Camp Lucky Strike there. And we stayed there a few weeks, not even a week, you know. To when was this? January 45, this was, maybe? This was 44. 44. This was 44. And How long after the landing at Normandy would, would this have well, been, you think? They landed in Normandy in June, mm -hmm. and I got there in November. Okay. First of November, around the first of November. And so, I mean, uh, the equipment was, you know, a lot of the equipment was still around, you know, the ships and sunk and there was tanks around there and everything, but uh, they, they had cleaned it up some, you know. But that was my first uh, encounter with what would be the war, you know, when we got off the ship, we got in, in tents, you know, and we went to breakfast, and I remember going through the line, they had French toast, I, and it stuck in my mind, because the fact is, when we got through eating uh, in the Army, they had big uh, garbage cans and you went through and you dumped your mess kit, you know, what you had left into a garbage can and everything. And we had that French toast and we dumped the remains in there and the, the coffee and everything. And these kids that were starving, they were really hungry, they were coming over and they were taking the bread out of the coffee can, you know, out of the garbage and eating it. And that was my first uh, encounter with anything that uh, connected with the war. Some uh, of them were probably not much younger than you were then. Well, were yeah, yeah, they were young kids and everything, you know, 10, 15, and that, yeah. and then older people, and they had to have something to eat. And I mean, I felt sorry for them, you know, but uh, the Army says you've got to dump it in there. and. And then if they took that, well, that's what they ate, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. So. Now, what division were you assigned to over there? When I, when I first got there, they assigned me to a rifle regiment, the 78, 92nd Infant, Infantry Regiment, Rifle Company. And we got into, they put us into boxcars and took us, I don't know, a couple hundred miles towards Belgium over there. And then, of course, then the trains were, couldn't run any farther. There was no tracks or that. And they took us out, put us in trucks, and took us up to another uh, replacement camp, which was temporary. And then they said they needed replacements for different divisions up there. and. My name come up to go to the 1st Infantry Division, and away I went. So Big Red 1. Big Red 1, 16th Infantry Regiment, 1st Division. Headquarters company, they put me in, and that was it. So so uh, how, how, how long was this before the surrender of Germany? It's, well, I was uh, assigned in January. And he surrendered in April, so about four months of. Did you go into Germany into into Berlin or? No, no, I went. Uh, 
Uh, that's where I first, I'll tell you, I was scared, S silly. I mean, uh, I was 16 then already. I mean, I was a real man. Till the first time they put us up on the line and they started shooting at me. And I thought, my God, why are they shooting at me? <laughs> you know, I didn't do nothing to them and all that. I thought, well, this is the real thing, you know. I, my God, I got into something that I maybe shouldn't have, you know, but uh, I wanted to get my brother out, so I stayed with it. And I ended up, we ended up over in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. We went up through that way and... Uh, were you around any injured, any of the division get injured much? Were you around a lot of carnage or whatever? Yes, yes. I How did that affect you? Terrible. Uh, sorry, I break up that. No, not a problem. Uh, a very good friend. Uh, my, being young, he was my neighbor. He lived right across the street from us. It was the first time I seen anything like that. He uh, got some shrapnel in the back of the neck, and it took his teeth out. And uh, we were going over a field, and we kept going till we got to this village, and then we went back. And he was laying there, and we thought he was dead at first, and they were going to get the graves registration, and that they said they'd take care of it. And then he moaned, and uh, then we called the medics, and he saved his life. But uh, he had a lot of plastic surgery in his mouth and everything else, and that, that was the first time I actually seen anything bad, but uh, on, on the majority, I mean, it, uh, you got, I, I got just like the rest of mine, you, you, you kind of steal yourself to, to what's going on, and you don't think about anything like when I first come in the company, the fellows wouldn't even hardly talk to me, because uh, I was a new recruit, and new recruits didn't last so long. I mean, they didn't figure that I'd be around long enough to even hardly know my name. They figured that you're there and then you're gone, and that was the big thing, you know, that uh, they did. So it uh, took me you know, quite a while to to get in with the, the veterans because there were some of uh, a few of them, not not many of them in the outfit, was from, went to Africa. And that was when they first went into land combat, and they didn't, they don't last long, you know. And a few of them did make it all the way through, which is amazing, that I thought so. But uh, we ended up in Czechoslovakia, and uh, we had, uh, we uh, rescued uh, or liberated a, a concentration camp over there, a small one. Uh, if anybody's ever seen the, the movie, The Big Red One, mm -hmm. they showed that, liberating that concentration camp. Of course, they made it up like it was a John Wayne thing or that, and it wasn't, you know. But to see them people uh, that come out of there, I mean, it's amazing that they lived. Uh, they were so skinny and picked on, you know, and beat and everything else. And then you seen the, the chamber where they burnt the bodies and all that, you know. It was a quite a kind of thing to see. Anybody who says there were concentration camps over there, they're liars. There were concentration camps. So, so uh, did you muster out in uh, Czechoslovakia? No, no. They, I went back to, uh, got 
they broke up the the division, and I was reassigned over into Munich, Germany. And they put me in a quartermaster outfit, and uh, I stayed in the quartermaster outfit for till '48 when I come back. And that was a much softer job. Uh, I worked in a PX in a stock room, so I didn't have any any worries about anything else. So I I stayed right there till they shipped me back. That was the end of it. Did you get out of the service then? Yeah, I I turned around and uh, I come home and I enlisted in the reserve. And then I found out that I didn't want to do any training. I thought I had enough of the Army. So I didn't go to the meeting, so they put me in the inactive reserve. And when the Korean conflict broke out, broke out the first ones they called in from my, my area was inactive reserve. So I was gone. So. Did it require a lot of retraining? Did they send you back? What do they do when, they, when you go back into service like that? Uh, they issued us uh, uniforms. They give us, we were supposed to be construction engineers. So they gave us construction equipment and everything else. And, and we went to Camp Carson, Colorado. And I had just, I was married in April, and I was called back in in August, and they told us we could have our wives at the camp, so my wife come down to Camp Carson, and she was there about two weeks, and they told her to, she had to go home because we were being shipped overseas. So they turned around and I, I was off and running for Korea, over to Korea then, and landed over there in, I think it was October 20th, something like that. 1950? 1950. And we were down in Pusan and pushed way down in there, and then they broke out and we went all the way to the Yellow River and when we come back our, our company, our engineer company, uh, we regrouped below the 38th parallel and when we tried to get everybody together again, you know, they were, we were scattered all over the place, you know, everybody got out of there the best way they could. And uh, when we ended up, now I don't know uh, what happened to the fellas or if they were killed or if they were captured or if they were reassigned someplace, but our, our company was 43% casualty. So uh, we didn't know where they were. I mean, some of them could have been with a different, you know, just picked up and they reassigned them. But uh, a lot of them, I mean, were, I mean, I think they froze, you know, up there. It was cold. You seem to be attracted to cold weather. I lived in Wisconsin, but I thought that was like Hawaii compared to up in North Korea. That, that place is cold up there. When it gets down 30 below to 40 below zero, and you've got no place to sleep, you know. Uh, we crawled in snow banks, you know, to keep, you know, warm. And it seems funny to crawl into snow, but it did help break the cold wind, and it did break, you know, the, the cold a little bit, so. Were you in a uh, construction unit, or, or he sounded like he was more like in the entry infantry than you were in the well, we were, engineer uh, battalion? They, they didn't want construction. Uh, uh, people over there when I went in because there was nothing to construct. We didn't have room. So our colonel said that we could fight as well as we could build, you know, so they turned us into combat engineers, which was uh, tr quite a transformation of what we thought we were going to do. Uh, 
we built a lot of small bridges for infantry outfits to go across it. A lot of times we were ahead of the infantry building bridges so they could go across, you know, and that. So uh, I thought, well, gee, this ain't the kind of life I like, you know. So I better get out of here. So I got out of the army then. Then what? Then what did you do? In civilian life? Yes, sir. I went. Uh, I got my high school diploma when I was. Uh, at home, and then I, I went into sheet metal work. And then I started my own company of hot dip galvanizing, which I didn't know nothing about. And I I got, uh, I retired as a, a owner of a company, so. Fantastic. And how old were you when you finally got out of the military? How was I? How old, how old were you? How old were you? When when I finally ended up out? Yes, sir. I think I was uh, about 23. Been to two wars. And two wars. By the time you was 23 years 23 old. 23 years old, yeah. But getting back to the Korean uh, War, was it as brutal, do you think, as World War II? You said you had 40% casualties. Uh, it was. It was uh, brutal as far as we didn't have equipment or, or uh, clothing. Uh, we weren't equipped for anything like we had over there. I mean, all the stuff we had uh, as far as equipment was from World War II. And uh, it it didn't it didn't uh, hold up over there in that weather, you know, and, and everything, and and there was a shortage of everything. Uh, you you had to wait for everything, you know, and uh, and it, it it there was when we got to Pusan, there was no place to put the stuff, you know, the equipment couldn't come in because there was no room down there, and they didn't know if we were gonna be pushed off the peninsula or not, you know, they, they had his back uh, in pretty bad shape there. And uh, when we got there, I said to this one sergeant at that time, I was just a corporal, and I said, that, yeah, I'd like one of them carbines. I said, this M1 rifle I got is pretty heavy to carry. I said, is there any chance of getting one? He said, sure, you a lot of them out there. I said, where do you get them? He said, go on out there. He said, the North Koreans got a lot of them. All you got to do is go out and take one off one of them. He said, he won't give it to you, but just go out and get one. I said, no, I don't want one that bad. <laughs> Everyone found it felt lighter, didn't it? Yeah, it felt much lighter then. <laughs> but, uh, but I see it. Uh, we didn't have any equipment in that over there at the start. You know, it was pretty... Everybody thought it was going to be a lark, you know, to, to go in there and push the North Koreans back a little ways because they're a small country and and they they thought it was going to be kind of a, a fun day. Well, they found out it was no fun at all. So. Was it a lot different being a soldier at 21 and 22 than it was at 15 and 16? Oh, yes, yes, it was. I mean, I was... Uh, by that time, I was a veteran, you know, and everything else, and I knew what to expect, you know. When I went in at 15, I didn't know what to expect, you know. And I, uh, I, I, the only reason I say I went in, my brother was captured by the Germans, and he was wounded at Anzio and in Italy, and he took him to Germany. And I knew that, so being a dumb kid at that time, uh, the news wasn't real big. I, I was going to go in and go over there and rescue him. I could just picture myself going in there and being a hero to him and all that, but I never seen him, you know, over there. Because uh, after the war, he got shipped right back, you know, and so I stayed over in Europe for a while. Thought I, after the war, I thought I might as well enjoy Europe for a little bit anyway. So I did. You earned it. Yeah. I, well, I, I figured I, I went and seen 
some of France. I went back on furlough to Italy, uh, to England, and uh, I bought my own Jeep over there. And I mean, after the war was over and nobody was pestering me, you know, trying to shoot me or that, I thought it would be kind of nice to be over there, and it was, you know. Have you been back since? Over to Europe now? Yes, sir. No, no, Not I have. Yet. I have no no desire really to go back over there. I mean, uh, I I don't uh, even hardly discuss it with anybody. You know, they like I say, if they talk to me about the anything, I I make jokes of a lot of stuff. Like I told you about the roast beef sandwich. Uh, and tell us again about that. You didn't. You were telling me about that beforehand. Well, this is in Korea, right? Right. That was in Korea up near the the Yellow River. Mm -hmm. uh, we just started moving back because the uh, Chinese were coming over at us. And we were moving all pretty fast, and our mess sergeant, I don't know where he ever got the beef, or it could have been a water buffalo for all I know, but he made sandwiches for us big thick sandwiches and he gave each fella in the, that was there a beef sandwich and said well this is probably be the last real cooked meal you'll get till you get back someplace so uh, he gave me mine and like I said I didn't have any gloves I had a pair of stockings socks and I cut holes so that my thumbs could hold the sandwich, and I had my rifle over my shoulder, so I was I would eat it or try to eat it, and I took a bite, and it was awful stringy. I took it out and threw it away. Took another bite, and I kept it up like that. And finally, it come to me the string on my parka. I was chewing on that every time I'd take a bite the string would get in my mouth, and I was chewing on that string, and it was ice cold, you know, it was like a icicle. And turn around, finally it come to me that I threw over half my sandwich away, you know, before I realized <laughs> it. I said, I'll never forget that. I said, so when I eat a roast beef sandwich, I always think of that, you know, make sure there's no string in it. <laughs> Can you still eat roast beef? Right. <laughs> Well, what uh, rank did you achieve? I, well, I was a couple times. I was oh. a sergeant over in Europe, and I seemed to always get in little trouble, you know, being young and all that. And then they'd push me back, and then I'd make sergeant again. And when I come out as a sergeant, and then when I went over to Korea, I kept my rank because I was in the the reserve, so I went in as a sergeant and I come out as a sergeant, so it wasn't too you behaved bad. yourself in Korea. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, the loader. Well, yeah, well, my my wife said that I had to, you know, so <laughs> it, was, it was a tough time, you know, uh, first time, you know, going in at 15 and then the next time I was just married and uh, to be called back into service. But uh, I think times are different when in World War it, uh, in World War One. I. I think that the whole United States, uh, the population, they were more patriotic, really. I mean, and really behind uh, everything. Uh, you didn't have demonstrations or stuff like that, like you do now. I mean. Uh, People didn't talk against it, you know. They were all saving tin and lard for the drives and all that. They had paper drives and everything else, and people were very, very much behind it, you know, and everything. They were, when you were in the service and that, they really, they really thought you were something, you know. Well, but all of us did, anyhow. So. Y'all really were. Yeah. Well, like I said, uh, you tell people, we, we come back, we were a very cocky 
bunch of fellows that come back out of the service. We figured we had just whipped the two most powerful countries in the world, and we were invincible, you know. We never get old or nothing like that, so here we are. We're old. Yeah. <laughs> Darn understand, old. I understand you were decorated a couple of, won a couple of bronze stars? No, I got one bronze, bronze star, star in over in Korea. And, uh, and I had two Purple Hearts, one in Germany and one in Korea. So uh, you were injured in both both wars, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so I mean, I I don't tell anybody what I got the Bronze Star for, and I don't. I think I was none of my business. Uh, well, and. Uh, I, I always say I must have been dumb to get hit, you know, and that. So the the Purple Hearts, you know, were for somebody that was an idiot and got hit, you know. So I get, I I don't know. Maybe I was lucky, you know. What do you think you really took away from all these adventures you had in both these wars? What that's kind would, of stuck with you? I will never give up. I mean, I I, I would never. Uh, want to go back and do it again, but I was—I never regretted that I did it. I've got a lot out of it. I mean, as far as living and myself, uh, understanding people a lot better by going in, and I know it wasn't a, a fun time, and uh, but I don't regret it one bit. Uh, I know a lot of fellows that'll say that, you know, in, uh, that were in World War II in Korea. They, uh, we weren't happy about it, you know, a lot of them, but uh, they don't regret it, you know. They, they were glad to do it, so I, I don't know, maybe it's a different attitude or something to people at that time, but I, I don't, I didn't mind, you know, regret it one bit. I thought I was doing something, you know, real good. Like I say, at the first time I thought I was going to be a hero. Second time I just wanted to live and get out of there. So there's a different attitude. But uh, no, I don't. I don't regret it one bit. Well, Dick, it's been great having you in here. We really uh, appreciate you sharing your uh, experiences with us. I know that. People that'll view these DVDs down the road will get a lot out of it too. Well, we really do appreciate it. Well, I hope that. Well, I mean, I don't. Uh, I didn't tell too much about what happened, but you know, I mean, I my feelings about the whole war and everything else. I mean, that's how I feel. You know, so I hope you can get something out of it. Oh, I'm sure we will. Thank you so much for okay. coming in today. Thank you. Glad to do it. Thank you.